La ilaha illallahu wahtahu la sharika lahu. Allahu akbaru kabiran, walhamdulillahi kathiran. La hawla wa la quota ila bilahi al aziz al hakim. Brothers and sisters, Brother Khalil Meek, all my esteemed family in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Now I'm going to thread this under the table because I like to walk when I uh, talk. <coughs> so, forgive me. Alhamdulillah, what an amazing venue this is, subhanAllah. Look at this, I think these, these are called Corinthian, can somebody tell me these Corinthian pillars? Are they Greek or Roman style? Somebody will know about architecture. Neither? SubhanAllah. Okay, you're going to tell me Art Deco? Come on, somebody help me out. Anyway, this is a very, very grand structure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gifted your community. So I ask Allah to uh, put barakah in uh, this wonderful uh, masjid that you have just been given as a gift, as a trust to your community. And that much great work for the Ummah um 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 in America comes to be here. I just want to thank the uh, MLFA again for hosting me in America because the reason that I come over here, it's my pleasure. It is my honor to speak to my brothers and sisters in America. But the reason that I come over, the intention is to support a very important organization that supports you. And I will let Brother Khalil talk about that afterwards, but that's why I'm here. And the big surprise for me is that I'm here at all. Because four years ago, I was not going to be a Muslim. I was very much not on a spiritual path. I had gone a long way from a spiritual understanding of the universe. And in deep, deep into my own nafs, deep into my own arrogance, stuff for love. But then something happened to me. But it was part of a long process. And that's what I'd like to share with you today, is just one servant of Allah's journey to this beautiful faith. So I'll begin at the beginning. My name is actually Sarah. My name isn't Lauren. I wasn't born Lauren. I was born Sarah Booth in the 19, I was going to say the 1970s, subhanAllah. Imagine, see how shaitan works. He wants you to start a talk to Muslims with a lie. So now I have to tell you my birth date. I was born in 1967. I have to humble myself now. I wasn't born in the 70s. <laughs> My uh, father is a well-known actor, his name is Anthony Booth, and he was a radical left-wing uh, political activist as well. And my mother at the time was a model and she made a, a film that had gone to the Cannes Film Festival with Stanley Baker, I don't think any of you will have heard of him, but she made one film and she was rather good. So when I was born, both my parents had left any idea of religion behind them. They had their own journey. And in the 60s and 70s, if you were beautiful and you were in the movie or the film industry or the TV industry, really religion was not going to be a part of your life in the United Kingdom. Uh, my father had rejected the Catholic Church because he had been aware, as a political person, of the corruption at the heart of Rome. I'm talking financial as well as everything else. And my mother, she was just superstitious. So she wouldn't, I never saw her really pray. I never saw her really ask God for anything. And I know she didn't like going to church. She found them spooky. But we were also had a home that was full of the cross. My mum used to go to markets and buy crosses. And she would hang them up to ward off evil spirits. So that was religion. In fact, there was one other thing that happened uh, to do with religion when I was small. My grandmother... She did used to pray. She was more old-fashioned as we considered her then. And she said to my father, you've got to get these girls, ba girls baptized. You have a very bad house here. You have bad friends. I want these children baptized. So my dad baptized me in the sink. He had so little respect for organized religion, he 
held my head under a tap and went, name the father, son, and but there you go. My grandmother screamed. But I was always a very religious child. In fact, my mum the other day, I spoke to her and she said, I've been talking to the rest of the family about why you're such an extremist. I thought, well, lovely to think the conversations they have about you. Why is, why is Sarah such an extremist? She said, it all began when you were little. You always liked to pray. And that's right. I was a little girl who just really physically understood that in our lives, there was a power structure. In my house, my father had very little power. My mother had a lot of power. And above them was my grandfather who had a little bit of power. My grandmother had so much power. She ran everything. But I knew as five years old, I knew that above them was God who had all the power and was making everything in the universe work. And I used to make dead nightly prayers, asking God for the things that little girls want. And one of the prayers I even remember, because I used to make it the most often, and it was this. Dear God, please, please, please take my younger sister away. Because she's really horrible. SubhanAllah, she's still with us today. and We get on much better now. But I made these prayers with fervor and I knew with my heart, no matter what my parents say, there was a God. And I knew he could hear me and I knew he was there somewhere above the stars. But it's not easy. It's not easy holding on to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us is the rope. The rope that ties the believing human being to the creator through understanding, through increase in knowledge. How hard it is to hold on to that rope in the secular West. You're not really in the secular West here. America's its own entity, but I'm telling you now, Europe is a secular place. The real religion in Europe now is Islam, but that's a discussion for another day. But growing up in a, se in a secular Europe in the 1970s, how do you hold on to the unseen? How do you keep your heart pure enough? At 10 years old, I had a friend stay overnight. And she was mocking me when I prayed. I put my hands together and I started to say, dear God, and she looked at me and she made that sound that girls make <laughs> in your nose. And she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm praying. She said, who to? Are you praying to the man on the cloud with a beard? Because that's the image that in Europe you have of God. He's a white guy on a cloud with a beard and uh, all the angels have these long sheets on them and that's, you know, from the Renaissance, that's what we're brought up with. This is the image that looks in your mind. And so, being a practical girl, all children are practical, I thought, well, is God sitting on a cloud? Can he be made small like that? As small as a cloud? Does he have a beard? Sometimes my dad has a beard. He's not that good. What does that say about God? I couldn't answer the questions. I had no understanding of what God was. And so very soon after that night, it became easier to stop praying. And once that, once that connection, that safety had gone, well then at 12 years old comes the ego. And the ego, as some of you here will remember and some of you will just be finding out, the ego of a 12 year old there's nothing quite like it. We all become the human being who says to the generation above us, what do you know about anything? Hands up anybody who said that. What do you know about anything, mom? SubhanAllah, I used to say it to my grandfather. My grandfather, what a lovely man he was. He fought in five invasions in the Second World War, five. He was riddled with bullets, and there was me at 13 and 14 saying to him, what do you know about anything anyway? He knew quite a lot, it turned out. So your ego comes into play, and then your hormones come into play, and then you can get very, very lost for a very, very long time. And that's what happened to me. 
I started to date boys, and I started to take drugs. Uh, by 14, I was smoking drugs on the way to school, and uh, they were from my best friend's mum. She used to give them to us. So that was that, was that really. SubhanAllah. Now, as a Muslim, I know, I've been a Muslim now three and a half years, alhamdulillah. I'm the same as you in that I love to hear reverts talk about how Allah reached out to them. I want to know these stories too. So I've had time to think about what are the moments that I want to hear, and I'm going to try and give you those moments. And one of them is, okay, you were lost. What's the moment when things started to change? What is the moment when some light got in? When you saw things differently, I'll tell you that moment for me. In the year 2000, I gave birth to my first daughter, Alexandra. And when she was just a month old, I was watching television at home. And you are so sensitive. As a, wo as a mother, when your first child is born, when that baby is in your arms, you want the universe to be just a safe place. I knew from the moment that I had a baby girl, I would never listen to rap music again. How could I listen to women spoken about that when I was holding a small future woman in my arms? I knew that I'd never watch another horror movie because I didn't want there to be any horror in the world anymore because I had a little human being to take care of. As I sat there in this very sensitive state, I was watching the TV news, and it was December 2000, and a photograph came onto the screen that would change my life, and it was this. There is a young boy in a photograph, and all you can see is his back. All I could see was the back of a young boy who looked about 10 years old. He was small, but the newscaster said he was 14. He was wearing jeans and a jumper. And all you could see was his back. But what was remarkable was the way he was standing. Because he was standing like this. Like, like, like a warrior. Like a brave man, not a little boy. And in his right hand, he had a stone. This little boy had a stone and he was about to throw it. But what was really remarkable about that photograph on my television screen was that the boy wasn't on his own in the photo. There was a tank and the tank was almost on top of him. But instead of doing what we would all do if a tank came in here now, we'd be running. We wouldn't be standing there with a stone going forward into the tank. We would be fleeing and screaming, but the boy was leaning in. The boy was leaning towards the tank with no fear in his body, subhanAllah. And I knew that that boy was not afraid of death. And I felt there holding my baby daughter that the men in that tank with their guns and their weapons, they were afraid of that boy. The news anchor said that the boy came from a place that I'd never really heard of called the Gaza Strip. And he came from one particular place called the Rafa Refugee Camp, and I want you to hold on to that name because I'll bring it up again later. And nine days later, that 14-year-old boy from Rafa his name was Faris Oday, was shot dead by an Israeli sniper. The bullet hit his neck and he bled to death on the floor of his refugee camp, protecting the women in his village, in his town, in his home, with a stone. When Allah has a plan for you, you can go to the left or the right, but you will go in the direction of that plan that has been written for you. I was not on an activist course in my late 20s and early 30s. I was, in a, I was a narcissist. I was very much into the cult of Lauren. I actually want to thank Tony Blair for radicalizing me. I'm sure he'd appreciate that. I must tell him one day. 
Yeah, I was going to sleep. I was going to sleep. I had, um, when I was 30 years old, wow, was it that long ago, subhanAllah. When I was about 34 years old, I had two daughters. My husband and I had bought a house in France. We had a swimming pool. We had a barn attached that we were renovating. We had rolling hillsides in the French countryside. We had everything you could possibly want in dunya. I was famous. Fame sounds so exciting, doesn't it? Famous. I was on, genuinely, I was on TV a lot. I would, people would send me stuff to wear. I got photographed wherever I went, and I went out with some pop stars and things as well. In between my marriage, we set, we split up. I went out with people. I was in the broadsheets. I was in the red tops. I was in the newspapers. I was famous. What did it all mean? In 2005, I walked into my editor's office, and as if the words were coming out by somebody else, I said. Peter, I want to go to Palestine and cover the elections there. I can't tell you why on earth I said that. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it was that picture of the boy. Allahu Alam. I think it was the picture of the boy. He said, my editor, why don't you go for two weeks? Here's some money. Go and write about the elections in Palestine. And a few days later, I found myself outside Tel Aviv Airport. I had three names on a bit of paper that the ambassador, the Palestinian ambassador to London, had given me. I didn't even know how to get from Tel Aviv to Palestine. SubhanAllah. Do you have any idea how ignorant I was? What was I doing there covering a heavy political story? It was not my work. My work was uh, commentary. It wasn't war correspondent. That was my job title. I was a commentator. I wrote sometimes about hairstyles and living in France and having children. I did not know anything about the Middle East. But there I was outside Tel Aviv airport, wondering what do I do now? And a man came over to me. And he introduced himself like this. Hi, my name is Jamal, but you can call me Jimmy. I said, hi, Jimmy. He said, I am a taxi driver, where do you want to go? I said, I want to go, I looked at the bit of paper, I want to go to Ramallah. He said, no problem. <laughs> I got into his taxi and we started to drive and it was an amazing journey because in around an hour and a half, Jimmy Jamal gave me 65 years of Palestinian history. He told me everything that had happened. And as we got into the rolling hills and my jaw dropped and my heart started to beat faster with a growing love for the land that happens in the first second you see it, I noticed that the road got worse for the Palestinians as we neared a checkpoint. But on the hillside, I saw a road that seemed to be going in the same direction and nobody was on it. I thought it was a toll road. I said to my driver, um, I don't want to tell you what to do, but why don't we use that road up there? He looked at me like I was crazy. Are you sure you are a journalist? You don't know very much about this, do you? I said, tell me. He said, look, that road up there is for Jews only. I am a Muslim. I am an Arab. I am Palestinian. If I take you in this car to that road for Jews, we will be shot for sure in maybe seven minutes. We can try. He went to turn the wheel. No. Don't try, I said. And one word came into my mind. And that word was apartheid. Because what other word is there for it? When you have a road system for one color, creed, or religion. And if the other religion uses it, they get shot dead. This is apartheid. It's also fascism. We went through a checkpoint. And I remember the young soldier with his gun who pointed it at Jamal and took his papers. 
And then he took my passport and he looked at it. He said in an American accent, in an Israeli soldier's uniform, wow, you're British. We love you guys. I didn't feel very proud of my British passport at that moment. That night, my first ever in Palestine, I cried myself to sleep. And what had I seen? What had I seen? One checkpoint, one apartheid road. And every single day since, I have wished with all my heart that that was as bad as it got for the people of Palestine. The next day was my first ever in the Middle East, the first ever in Palestine, and I was woken up by my phone telling me, somebody called me and told me, you have got an interview with Mahmoud Abbas today on the day of the election. Now this, wallahi, this is a miracle. I was an unknown rookie journalist, first day in the Middle East, you get an interview with the next leader in the region. SubhanAllah, it was amazing. I was put into a car with members of Fatah. We were drove around the streets like crazy people. I remember we were doing U-turns and skidding around piles of rubble and it was like being in a Tom Cruise movie. I was sitting in the back, feeling all kind of hyped up and excited. And I said to, um, gosh, what was his name? I forget his name, Imad. I said to Imad, hey, are we trying to lose a tail? Are we being followed? He said, no, Ibrahim has lost the idiot. <laughs> Turn around. I have to tell you now, brothers and sisters, forgive me, I do come from an acting family. So I really have to do the accents. And especially to my Arab brothers and sisters, it's with absolute love. So forgive me. We go to a building where I'm going to interview Mahmoud Abbas and it's full of bullet holes. I've never seen anything like it. And to negotiate, to get an interview with a world leader, you have to be taken with their security. And Mahmoud Abbas's security were very, very gigantic, huge Palestinians with guns. The man on my right, he was six foot five. I'm six foot. The man on my left, six foot eight. They both had guns and they were standing like this, looking at me. I went into a metal box, which was an elevator, with the two men on my own. And another man with a gun said, phone. And I gave him my phone. Bag. I gave him my bag. And then they closed the doors. My heart started to pound. Then the walkie-talkie of the man on my right went <laughs> He picked it up and he said <laughs> And in my mind I heard the translation We'll kill the white woman later <laughs> And I realized that I had Arabophobia, that I was terrified, that I really thought that because these men, just because they were, that I didn't even know if they were Muslim, just because they were Arabs and they had guns, of course I was at risk. This is what these crazy people do, right? In my mind, that's what I was thinking. Now there's a saying that a week is a long time in politics. Have you heard that? A week is a long time in politics, but three days in Palestine, that's a whole lifetime. And three days later, I was so touched. I was so touched by the people that I met there and the kindness and the goodness that my life changed. I'll give you an example. An old lady, one day came up to me when I was walking in Manar. It's an area of Ramallah. And I didn't have my coat with me and it was January and I was cold. And she came up and she said, yalla, 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 yalla. And she called me like this and she just pulled my arm. So I went with her. I followed her. I didn't know where she was going, but you know, old ladies are bossy, right? It doesn't matter what country you're in. 
the way they say it. Yeah, love. It's like, okay, okay. So she took me into her home, very humble home. She took me straight into her bedroom and she opened up a cupboard and she just took out her coat. Maybe it was her husband's, maybe it was her daughter's, Allah Allah, she put it on me. Then she took out a case and she put some clothes in the case and she gave me the case. She showed me to the door and she said, Salam Alaikum. And a very poor, humble woman that I'd never met before in my life had clothed me, a wealthy person from the West. And my heart felt like it grew two sizes with love and gratitude. SubhanAllah. When Allah has a plan for you, you go to the left or the right of that plan, but you will go in the direction that has been written for you. I wasn't planning to become a Muslim, but I was getting involved in the question of justice for Palestine. Suddenly it was like nobody else in the world could see and I wanted to shout from the top of a mountain, why aren't you looking at this? And it was very frustrating as a journalist. I devoted my columns to getting just two or three words in that would try to reveal what Israel was doing. I was very proud one day when I got the word Zionazi into a right-wing newspaper. This for me was like, this is a massive victory. You know, I used to, every week I would get into arguments with my editor. So he said, you can't put that in, it's not relevant. I'm like, well then take the whole thing out. We'd have to bargain just to get a little bit about Palestine and that became my job as far as I was concerned. But Islam was being put in my path. I wasn't looking for it, but I was looking for truth. And I was looking for justice. Yes, I was, but I didn't think I was looking for Islam. In 2007, I got a phone call. I was living in France, and it was from the head of the Islam channel. His name is Muhammad Ali. And he called me for a meeting in London. I didn't know what he was going to say. I was a drinking party girl at that time. I was definitely not Islam channel material. But he sat me down in a restaurant. And Muhammad Ali has a beard down to here. And he sometimes wears a thobe. And to me, he looked really quite strange. And when he met me with his head of programming, in a London restaurant, the first thing I did was this. Waiter, I'll have a bottle of wine, please. SubhanAllah. A Muslim man, clearly, who practices his faith, has invited me to a meeting and I order wine. Muhammad Ali sat there very quietly as the bottle was opened. He didn't say anything as it was put on the table. And as I went to pour the glass, he said very politely, excuse me, Miss Booth, there is something I have to tell you before you drink your wine. Uh, firstly, the Islam channel will not be paying for it. <laughs> Secondly, I cannot sit here while you drink it. It is against my religion, but enjoy your wine. And when you are finished, we will continue our meeting. Now, Muhammad Ali, I've known him since. He's a very wise, clever guy. He could have sat at another part of the restaurant, we can debate this, far, far away and texted, done some work, but he didn't. He chose to go outside the whole restaurant because I was drinking wine. And he walked up and down in the street waiting for me to drink my wine on my own. He walked like this looking maybe a bit cold and I felt something that I hadn't felt in a very, very long time. Maybe since I was 10 years old. I felt shame. 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 What had happened to the little girl I once was? What kind of adult had I become that I had no respect for a person of another religion who came and sat at a table with me? What sort of person have I become that alcohol is so important that I would absolutely disrespect another person? I 
felt shame and I couldn't drink the wine and I got the waiter to take it away and then we began our meeting. Muhammad Ali said to me, we would like you to come and work at the Islam channel as our chief interviewer. I said, okay, you know I'm not Muslim, right? He said, yes, I guessed. I said, well, there's two conditions before I come to work for you. Condition number one, please don't try and make me Muslim because I'm never gonna be Muslim. It's not for me. I, I like you guys, you're nice people, but I'm not the kind of person who's going to become Muslim. Muhammad Ali looked at me and smiled. He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows whether or not you will be Muslim and you do not know. I said, no, 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 no. Your Allah doesn't know about me, okay? He doesn't know about me. I know I'm not gonna be Muslim. He said, Allah knows and you don't know. I said, I know, he, does, he knows, I know, he knows, I know. We did agree to disagree. Secondly, I said, don't ask me to wear hijab because I will never ever wear hijab. I think it denigrates women. SubhanAllah. Be careful, we are warned. Don't say I will definitely see you tomorrow. Don't say I will definitely do this. Don't say, who's heard of the Titanic? That was the ship that was never gonna sink. Don't set up these challenges. There's only one almighty. There's only one definitive. There's only one definite. <coughs> SubhanAllah, I took the job. And that meant that for two years I traveled the world meeting some of the greatest scholars and academics in Islam of the modern age. SubhanAllah. And my heart began to be touched. One man who made an impact on me was Sheikh Raid Salah. Sheikh Raid Salah. Who's heard of Sheikh Raid Salah? MashaAllah, Raid Salah. Yeah, he's a great, great man. He's known as the Lion of Palestine. Raid Salah, yeah, MashaAllah. What an amazing man. I met him at one o'clock in the morning in the uh, foyer of the hotel to do an interview. And he walked up to me like this. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I thought, this is the lion of Palestine? He doesn't look so lion-like. He doesn't look so scary. In this age, you see, we confuse arrogance with power. In this age, we confuse people who show off with real knowledge, with real confidence, with hikmah. We make these mistakes all the time. Ryan Salah sat down and he never looked me really in the face. Now as a Western journalist, I had received the knowledge by subconsciously that if Muslim men don't look you in the face, it's because you are a disgusting kafir. They wish they, if they looked you in the face, they would have to wash themselves because they're so full of hatred for you. Some, somewhere in the back of your mind, you kind of wonder about that. But when Sheikh Ryan Salah didn't look at me, I knew it was because he was somewhere else. He wasn't even in the room. SubhanAllah. You know when you meet someone and you feel iman from them? Wow, you want to sit five minutes with Sheikh Ryan Salah. My heart started to change. But I was not on the road to Islam, brothers and sisters. I was not on the road to Islam. I was not interested. To you, yours, to me, mine. I liked alcohol. I liked bacon. I liked living my life my way. But when Allah has a plan for you, you can go to the left or the right, but you will go in the direction of the plan. I'd like to share with you now how I got my first Quran. Would you like to hear? Yes. yes. Alhamdulillah. I went back to Palestine. I made another excuse to my editor. I said, I want to do a follow-up to my first article. He said, here's the money, go for two weeks. This time I went to Gaza. And I was at the Erez crossing, a place that is hell. There's no other way. 
You know what? Uh, alhamdulillah, I don't get scared. Alhamdulillah. It's just not one of those things. Just alhamdulillah. I don't know. You know, I'm foolish. I don't have. I know I don't have wisdom either, but I don't have fear. So uh, may Allah grant us all balance in everything we have. But I don't get afraid. But Erez crossing. Wow, that is a place of evil. It's one of the only exits to the Gaza Strip. The only other one is through Rafa into Egypt, and that's closed. The one into Erez, if you're under 40 years of old age, you can't get through, you can't escape Gaza. As a journalist, I was there, and I was leaving one trip, and I was told it would take three hours because I was foreign. It was 10 o'clock in the morning when I got there, and I thought, what am I going to do when I get to the other side? I have to get to Jerusalem. I need a taxi. I looked in my travel bag, and there was the card that said, Jimmy Jamal, taxi cab, Jerusalem. And there was his number from the year before. I thought, well, it's my only choice. So I'll have to call him. He won't remember me. And why would he come all the way from Jerusalem to Erez? But I'll try. I called him, and this was the conversation. Hello, is that, um, uh, is that Jimmy Jamal? Is that Lauren? <laughs> the sun has risen over Palestine again. My wife can stop crying. My children's smiles will return to their lips. And our hearts ring with joy. Welcome back to your homeland. I thought, subhanAllah. Or whatever I would have thought at the time. Like, wow, probably. He did remember me. And there is nothing like Arabic when it comes straight from the lips without it being translated. You know, when it's literally from Arabic straight into English. It's the most beautiful thing you've ever heard. There is nothing like it. Forget French poetry. Forget Shakespeare. These people can make you feel love like you've never, you've never had love until you've been to Palestine and heard the Arab people there speak to you about how much they miss you. So I was there at 10 o'clock in the morning and there was an old lady next to me and she was in a wheelchair. A Gazan lady and she was going to America to have an operation on her spine and the Israelis had given her permission. She was telling everybody, I'm going to America, my son is in America, I have operation in America, I'm going to walk again in America, today I go to America. She was very happy. At 11 o'clock, the Israeli military called her through the checkpoint of hell, a kilometer of no man's land, a hundred meters of tunnels where you're watched and pointed and shouted at by machinery, searched at the other end, made to wait at gunpoint. She went through and we cheered her off. She was going to America, she was gonna walk again. But that's not what happened. At one o'clock she came back. She said, they're not gonna let me through, they say my papers aren't right. We were angry. There were members of the Palestinian government there, the uh, assembly. There were World Health Organization workers, UN members. We said to the Palestinian coordinator, tell them she's got to go through. We're going to cause big problems for them. We're going to start making phone calls. They better let her through. One o'clock, she went back through. We waved her off. Three o'clock, she came back crying. She was screaming in Arabic, why are they doing this to me? I'm an old lady, I'm in pain, I'm not a terrorist. She missed her plane. At five o'clock, for no reason that we could understand, suddenly they let everybody through the checkpoint and after we were all searched and our bags were smashed and routine humiliation, I found myself in the dark in a big parking lot in the middle of nowhere. My phone was dead and I called the taxi at one in the afternoon. A car came speeding towards me. I thought, what now? The door th flew open. I looked in. It was Jimmy Jamal. <coughs> Salam alaikum, he said. I said, what are you doing here? He said, you ordered a taxi, yes? I said, yes, I ordered a taxi at one o'clock. He said, yes. I said, it's nearly six o'clock. He said, I waited. I said, you waited five hours? 
and you didn't even know if I was going to be here. Why did you do that? He said, I waited because I am Muslim. And we would never leave a woman on her own at risk. I got into the taxi and I started to cry. I started to cry because of the injustice of it all. I started to cry because of the goodness of Jimmy Jamal and all the goodness of the people I'd met. And it was one of those proper men shouldn't see type of cries. One of those... <laughs> Jimmy Jamal was very sympathetic in the way that Arab men are sympathetic. He said to me, stop crying, you're hysterical. If you keep crying, I take you to hospital. I said, I can't stop crying, they're so horrible and you're so nice and it's so wrong. <laughs> in the end, he made me stay the night at his wife's house with his family. And the next day, I haven't forgotten about the Quran. I had some shopping to do in the old city of Al-Quds. I had 40 minutes and I was in a bad mood. I was stressed, it was raining, but I was in Quds. I was on those cobbled streets where Isa alayhi salam would have walked. Where Omar ibn Qatar would have walked. I was walking those streets. And I was looking at my piece of paper and wondering where am I gonna get my souvenirs and a young Palestinian man walked next to me like this. They bounce there, they bounce. Honestly, you should see when they dance in Gaza, when the men dance. What's the dance called? Why has it gone from my mind? Come on, go dukka. Dukka, they leave the ground like this. It's the maddest thing. I've seen dukka around the world and they only do this. In Gaza, it's this, subhanAllah. This young man, he bounced up to me and he said, Mahaba! I looked and I thought, oh, no Mahaba today, I'm busy. <laughs> and in my mind, a voice said to me, don't you dare. Don't you dare disrespect a Palestinian in their own land when they've been nothing but nice to you. You speak to that young man. I turned to him, I said, Mahaba. He said, what can I do for you? I said, I have some shopping to do. He said, this is great news. All of the men in the souk are my uncles. We can go shopping together, yes? I said, okay. In the next 40 minutes, we went in and out of maybe 10 different stores. And we had 10 cups of mint chai with the uncles. And in every cup of chai was 10 sugars. That is 100 sugar. You nearly killed me that day with diabetes. SubhanAllah. An hour later, I was standing in the rain and I had everything that I wanted. And on my list were two stuffed camels, two toy camels. Of course, for my daughters. What else do you get when you go to Middle East? Two camels. Was that racist? Maybe it was. My husband would say, God, you're racist. Forgive me. Two camels, and on the bottom of my list was a Quran in English. I wanted to see if the Quran had ever been translated into English. I didn't really believe anyone would have bothered. Because I thought only a few people in the Middle East would, 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 were Muslim. I didn't know how many Muslims there were. But I wanted one because to me, it had become a guidebook for goodness. Because if the Palestinians read the Quran, and they were so nice, like an alien race of niceness and kindness, maybe it was their secret book. And I knew I needed to be kinder and I needed to change. We stood in the street, the young man and I, and I can't tell you his name because I never saw him before that day and I never saw him afterwards. And I had many, many bags of shopping and presents and a Quran in English and I said to him, how much do I owe you? He looked at me. Oh, you don't owe me anything, he said. But I do ask one thing of you. Please, please. Don't forget Palestine when you go. And that's how I got my first Quran as a gift from the people of Palestine to someone who meant them no harm. 
Subhanallah. When Allah has a plan for you, you'll go to the left or the right. But you will arrive at the destination that's been written for you. In 2008, I got an email and the email said, would you like to go to Gaza by boat? By this point, my daughters were eight and five years old and I was starting to get pressure from my family about my activism. Because of my writing, I was getting less work. Because of my giving talks about Palestine, people were starting to turn me down for work. I was starting to get some pressure. Doesn't matter what the pressure is, but if there's any activists here, you'll know what I'm talking about. But my family, certain members of my family were telling me, lay off the question of Palestine. They're not your people, they're not your religion, they're not your faith. It's not your business, you'll ruin your career, you'll lose everything, don't get involved. And then I got an email, and the email said, would you like to go to Gaza by boat? Call this number. 2008. The siege of Gaza had just begun. And I knew what that siege meant. And I don't think many of you here will know because your media doesn't let you know. So let me take a moment, please, to describe what a siege means. What the siege of Gaza means. There are 1.8 million people in Gaza. 800,000 of those people are children. They have a coastline, but three miles from the coast are Israeli warships. So no fishermen are safe. They can't fish in their own waters without being shot at, or their boats destroyed. There is no way out of Gaza. It's 24 kilometers long, by in some places as narrow as four kilometers. And all around it is barbed wire and watchtowers. It is a concentration camp. No goods can come in that aren't approved by Israel and none can be exported. The strawberries rot in the fields. The tulips die. It's a terrible thing. And I knew in 2008 it was a terrible thing. Go to Gaza by boat was dangerous. I went to see my editor and I said, I want to go to Gaza by boat. He said, okay, here's the money, go for two weeks, write about it. And I, when I stood outside his office, I thought, is he just trying to get rid of me? Is it cheaper not to sack me? In August 2008, I was in Cyprus with 44 other human rights activists. And they were mostly Americans, mostly women over 50, subhanAllah. No Muslims, only one, his name is Bashir Al-Farah. He was from Gaza and he demanded to come on the boat. We said, Bashir, if anything happens, you're going to be the one they shoot. He said, I don't care, my mother died, they wouldn't let me see her. My mother died crying for her Bashir. In Gaza, they wouldn't let me get to her to say goodbye. I want to go home in dignity on a boat. We had two really terrible boats in Cyprus. And we were all going to go on them. And we were going to sail towards Gaza. And if we sunk, we didn't care. Because it's not worth living in a world where 800,000 children do not have their rights. We got on the boat. And we sailed 20, hang on, how many hours? 32 hours across the Mediterranean Sea, and everybody was sick. The ships were going from side to side like this, 32 hours like this. I was the only one who wasn't sick, alhamdulillah. There was a man from Al Jazeera on the boat. He was making hourly reports because we thought we were going to get blown up. Let's be honest. I don't know if anybody here, any of you here have heard of the Marvi Marmara. Hands up if you've heard of the Marvi Marmara. Okay, alhamdulillah, a few people. I don't blame you if you haven't, by the way, it's your media. The Marvi Marmara was a ship that went several years ago from, Cyprus, uh, from Turkey to Gaza, and nine Turks were massacred by the Israeli Defense Force. So the ship was going backwards and forwards. We didn't know if we were going to make it. But then on the 23rd of August, in the morning, 
our Irish skipper climbed up the mast and he looked in the distance, he said, land ahoy. And there was Gaza. We'd made it. The free Gaza was the first boat to arrive on the Palestinian coast in 44 years. Allahu Akbar, the first non-violent, non-enemy ship to arrive in 44 years? I was one of those passengers, alhamdulillah. And when we got closer, we looked out and there were dots. There were dots on the port and we didn't know what they were and we were looking and then we realized the dots were 40,000 Palestinians. 40,000 Palestinians had flocked to the coast to cheer in the crazy European Americans and Australians who'd risked their lives to come in solidarity with them. And as we got closer, the sound hit me. And the sound was one thing. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. It was the best day of my life. I wasn't supposed to stay. I was supposed to go home five days later. But when the boats left, I wasn't on them. I felt that I had work to do. And I felt as well that my feet were glued to the ground of Gaza. And in the end, when I tried to leave after seven, eight days, the Egyptians, the Mubarak regime laughed at me. The guard said, <laughs> you want to be like Palestinian? Well, now you live like Palestinian. Bye bye. You live in Gaza now. Can you imagine? My daughters in France, I thought I'd never see them again. And I was there in Gaza for four weeks. And do you know what month of the year it was, brothers and sisters? Can you guess? It was Ramadan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had put me for the whole month of Ramadan in Gaza with some of the most beautiful people of this ummah. One night, I was taking some meat to a very poor family. And I knocked on the door and the door was in the Rafa refugee camp. Subhanallah, look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works. Look how he works, look how complex his plan is. Eight years earlier I'd been watching Gaza on the TV, I'd been watching Faris Ode in the Rafa refugee camp, then without any planning, not any planning on my part, I find myself in Rafa in the story. I knocked on the door and the mother opened it like this. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Fadan, welcome, come. She was so happy. She had the most beautiful smile I have ever seen in my life. Her skin was shining. Her eyes were bright. And I know the word for it now is Noor. This mother of Rafa had been fasting. And in Ramadan, her face was full of Noor because she is one of the oppressed. And I went inside and her home was just a single room with nothing in it. And I felt angry at Islam for the first time. And I said to her, why do you fast in Ramadan? Why do you fast? Why do you go without water for 30 days when your water is dirty anyway? You say your God loves you and you do without food, but you do without food all year round anyway. Why do you fast? And she looked at me and she said, I fast in Ramadan to remember the poor. Subhanallah. This woman, this mother, who lived in one room with no possessions, was so grateful to Allah for one iftar of meat that she would fast her whole life in gratitude. Subhanallah. This mother of Rafa who would have nothing in dunya wanted to humble herself before God just for being alive. At that moment it felt like a light entered my heart. 
And that was the moment when I thought, if this is Islam, I want to be Muslim. If this gratitude to God for whatever he chooses to give you is Islam, I want to be Muslim. If this love for your neighbor that makes you remember them even when your children are hungry, if this is Islam, I want to be Muslim. Subhanallah. But that's not what happened in my story. When I left her house, I went back to sinning. I went back to lying. I went back to greed and selfishness. And I forgot about the feeling of Allah in my heart. I forgot. But do you know what is beautiful, brothers, sisters? Allah never forgot me. He never forgot me. And he never forgets you either. This is our Rahman our Rahim. No matter how far we go, Allah is still merciful to us. And two years later in Ramadan, I walked into a masjid and I had a feeling of peace. And I had a feeling that made me want to sleep the night in the masjid and I stayed the night. And seven days after that, I walked into another masjid in London and I said my shahada, la ilaha illallah wa shahaduna muhammadin abdul rasulullah. And I became Allah Muslim. Akbar. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Bless you. Thank you so much. And you're Palestinian. <laughs> Am I right? Yes. Sure. Alhamdulillah, these are beautiful. I want to end now and pass you over to the real guest of the evening, Brother Khalil Meek. But I want to leave you with the word that is the most said word in the Gaza Strip, Alhamdulillah. And when the people of Gaza say it, they don't say it the lazy, stupid way you and me might say it. And how are you? Alhamdulillah. Well, the car broke down and my wife's annoying. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. The job's not so good, you know. <laughs> Subhanallah. What we're really saying is not Alhamdulillah, but I'm ungrateful because I think this. We're not saying Alhamdulillah, but in Gaza, Allah Akbar. I went to visit a family last April in Bayat Hanoun, and I walked into a garage, an empty stone building, just a hundred meters from the Israeli tanks and weapons of death. And there were 15 children in the house and two adults two mothers and there were no lights and there was no heating and there was no furniture and I spoke to the mother Iman and she introduced me to her son Omar and Omar is six but he looks four he's shrunk because the children of Gaza don't have enough to eat for such a long time they have stunted growth their bones are bad their teeth no teeth finished that's because of the bad water they drink. 90% of the water you can't drink in Gaza. It makes you sick. You and me, we'd die. I met Omar. Omar had white burns on his legs. I said to his mother, what is it? She said, white phosphorus. Do you know what white phosphorus is? Anyone? It's Nepal. It's Nepal of the 21st century. That's what they're using. That's what Israel uses on the children of Gaza, Nepal. There was a, an older boy, he was 16, mashallah, tall. He had a big plaster on his leg. His mother ripped it off for me to see. I nearly threw up a big scar, fresh. I said, what's this? She said, an Israeli sniper shot him outside the house. Two little girls were sitting there on the floor. They were just doing this. I said, why don't they talk? She said, they haven't talked for three years because of all the bombing. They're in shock. I went into a back room. I started to pray. I made my Maghrib Salah and I put my head down and I started to cry. I couldn't help it. All I could say was, Ya Allah, Ya Allah. And the mother, Iman, came and she touched my shoulder. She said, are you okay? Why are you crying? As if she couldn't see. As if she couldn't see how she lived. Why are you crying? I said, I'm crying because I hate this. I hate this for you. I hate that Israel is going to keep hurting your children. I hate that the world knows and we do nothing. I hate that I'm here and I can't stop this. 
I hate this life for you. And this mother of Gaza looked at me and she said, you're crying for us. She said, then don't cry because we are so happy. She said, we are happy because we have Allah and Allah loves us. And Allah loves us so much that he has said that if we stay, he has promised us Jannah. Alhamdulillah. So brothers and sisters, let us remember to be grateful. And let us remember the people of oppression. And let us pray for our brothers and sisters. And I ask Allah to forgive me for everything I've said wrong this evening. And all praises for Allah. Alhamdulillah. And I want to pass you over now to Brother Halil Meek, who is the reason, uh, alhamdulillah, that I'm here with you tonight. Because the Muslim Legal Fund of America is one of these causes that is doing justice for the Ummah. And we must support these. Because people in America, your brothers and sisters here, they're also suffering injustice. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you.